25. Once I read verse 25, we'll pray and look right uh, into the scripture for this evening. Notice verse 19 with me, if you will. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, notice verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now notice Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Verse 25, the Bible says this, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you so much that we can be in your house. We thank you just how, Lord, in corporate worship and just through the specials, we've been blessed and just really been reminded of some truth that encourages our hearts. I pray, Lord, that as we look to your word, that you truly would be the focus, that you would speak and that you would challenge and that you would convict uh, what I have to say or my wisdom really is meaningless. Lord, what you need to say and Lord, your spirit speaking, Lord, that's what we desire. I don't know each and every heart or whether maybe someone is discouraged, uh, maybe indifferent, um, or maybe even unsaved, but you know that. And I pray that through your spirit and through your word that you would give exactly what's needed this evening. May you be the focus. May you be glorified. God, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but a while back I had a curious thought of... I wonder what a particular pastor's sermon notes look like. It's kind of a weird thought. I'm not sure if you've ever had it, but it is interesting on the rare occasion that maybe an evangelist, a missionary, or a pastor, you actually get to see a pastor's sermon notes. Uh, Some pastors uh, handwrite all of their sermon notes. I do not do that uh, because my handwriting is terrible. I told the church this morning, we were at Heritage Baptist Church, that oftentimes I'll write something down. If I had the intelligence, I could have been a doctor, but the intelligence wasn't there. The handwriting certainly is. Uh, but I don't handwrite my notes for that sake. But there are individuals that do. There's some that type them out in a very manuscript form, and you can really look at uh, everything they plan to say in a particular sermon. Some people will take just a three by five card and maybe write down a few particular notes to kind of launch off of those bullet points. There are a very few, I think, but there are a few preachers that don't use notes at all. And yet, uh, for This particular passage of scripture, the reason that I bring that up is because many people would consider the book of Hebrews to be more of a sermon, more sermonic, a homily, if you will. In fact, one commentator said this, Hebrews is a sermon, an exhortation in epistolary or letter form. The history of the Christian Institute said of Charles Spurgeon that in 1865, His sermons sold 25,000 copies a week. In fact, you could pick up Charles Spurgeon's sermon right next to the daily newspaper. They were translated into over 20 different languages. As we come and as we approach the book of Hebrews, you could look at it, if you will, as gaining insight into a divinely inspired sermon. Yes, it's a letter. Yes, it's an epistle. But it kind of has, if you will, a sermonic type of style. As we look at the book of Hebrews... Uh, Many people would debate and question, well, who is the author? Uh, Who is the individual that actually wrote this? Some people would suggest Paul. Some people would say Barnabas. Others would say Apollos. We're not sure necessarily who the individual human author is, but we do know it is divinely inspired, given by God. But what is, I think, equally as important is who the audience is. Who is the author actually speaking to? And most people would conclude that The individuals that are being directly spoken to in this particular letter are Jews that followed at one time Judaism, but had received Jesus Christ, and now they are in Christ. They are Christians. They are followers of Christ. However, knowing the background of that gives you some insight into the content and the material of the book of Hebrews. I don't know about you, but there has been times in my Christian journey, the book of Hebrews was really intimidating. 
And the reason that that was is because so much of the language, if you don't have an Old Testament understanding, so much of the language, so much of the subject matter seems a little bit foreign. There's a lot talked about the tabernacle. There is much talked about the priesthood. There's a lot of detail given about sacrifices. There's a lot of Old Testament saints that are mentioned. And if you just dive into the book of Hebrews, not knowing kind of the context of it, it kind of throws you off a little bit. But the reason that the author is giving so much Old Testament reference is because of the particular audience that he was addressing. These individuals were saved. They knew Jesus Christ. They had left, if you will, Old Testament Judaism to some respect, and they were now adherents to Jesus Christ. We won't for time's sake, but as we look through the book of Hebrews, we gain these little snippets, these little insights into the spiritual condition of these particular Christians at this particular time. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, it's an exhortation in some respect to the believers not to let the truth slip. And that idea behind slipping, it means to drift. And obviously there was a temptation in the hearts of these particular believers that they would allow the truth of the gospel, the truth specifically in reference to Jesus Christ, to just kind of drift away. It also talks about in Hebrews chapter 5 that they should have been at the point in their Christian journey that they were teaching others. And yet, again, somewhat of a challenge and a rebuke, the author says you should be teachers, not necessarily in the place of needing to be taught. Now, we all need to be taught. No one is going to have perfect knowledge until we get to heaven. But there should come a time in our Christian walk that we go from just receiving to where we begin to give out. And they should have been at that particular place in their Christian journey, but they, if you will, had grown complacent. It had been a little bit indifferent. In Hebrews chapter 10, it also gives us a little insight into the spiritual trials that they were going through. We all go through valleys, do we not? I tend to think that my valleys are much deeper and much harder than anyone else's because they're mine, they're personal. But as we look at the persecution, the difficulties, the valleys that these Christians were going through, they were going through some significant hardship. And yet, as you look at their spiritual condition, you can imagine in your own mind, they're going through difficulty. They've grown to a place where they've been a little bit indifferent towards the truth to some respect. And then they should be a little bit further along in their Christian life, but they weren't. As we begin to look at the book of Hebrews, it would seem as if the author would immediately go into the exhortation, the challenge. This is what you need to fix and this is what you need to do. However, as we look at the, the book of Hebrews... We don't see the main primary portion of the exhortation come until this chapter, chapter 10. Now, again, there's a few little exhortations, challenges, charges sprinkled throughout the entire book. But the bulk of it does not really come until the end of the book. I think there's something to be learned from that. And I would encourage you to remember this. The doing of Christianity must never be disconnected from the doctrine of Christ. One pastor from the U.S. by the name of Mark Minnick says that doctrine always precedes practice. The doing of Christianity is significant. The actions of Christianity certainly are important, but they never must be disconnected from the doctrine that we see within the scripture. However, if you're anything like me, there are times that we seem to find much of our purpose, much of our identity, much of our, if you will, significance in the doing of Christianity. And certainly we are exhorted not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers. But if we're not careful, the doing, the action, the performance can be the only thing that we focus on. And here, what the author of Hebrews does is he begins to help these believers realize the accomplishments of Jesus Christ that lead us to a particular action. In fact, he spends a good majority of the book on this is who Jesus Christ is. In fact, if you look at the entire book, 
the structure of it is intended to lift up and to make Jesus Christ superior. The way that the author does this in chapters 1 through 2 is he, if you will, compares Jesus Christ and shows how he is much superior to the angels. In chapters 3 through 4, he shows how Jesus Christ is superior to Moses and Joshua. And the chapters that we're looking at here, chapter 10, from chapter 4 through 10, the author shows how Jesus Christ is a much better and superior priest and sacrifice. The focus of this section in chapter 10, in fact, is showing that what Christ accomplished as our priest and sacrifice should lead us to action. By way of introduction, quickly I want to share a few points with you of the doctrinal or the accomplishment aspect of this letter that we see here in Hebrews chapter 10. First of all, we see the insufficiency of the Old Testament sacrifices. Notice verse 1 again quickly. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. God ordained sacrifices. We see that all throughout the Old Testament. He instituted it. They were supposed to offer them. There was a, a part of their ritual, if you will. That is what they were commanded to do. But what the author here does to these particular believers that were maybe beginning to feel the pressure of following Jesus Christ, of adhering to the truth of Jesus Christ, and maybe in their minds they're thinking, well, maybe it would be a little bit easier on us if we would just go back to following Judaism. Maybe we should just go back to following the Old Testament law. And here the author says, listen, let me show you how much greater Christ is. Let me show you how far and superior he is as your sacrifices. That which was done in the Old Testament, those were just shadows. Let me give you an illustration of that. I don't know if any of you have been to a restaurant where you begin to look at the menu and instead of it just being words and prices, they actually show pictures. Now usually, typically, depending on the restaurant that you go up to, you look at the picture and you think, that looks incredible, that looks very tasty. I hope it actually looks like that when it comes to my table. And typically, we're disappointed when it actually arrives. But as you look at that particular image on that particular menu, that is not the actual physical substance that you're going to put into your mouth. It's an image, it's a representation, if you will, it's a shadow. I shared this with our church, and I think many of them were shocked when I shared this, so don't judge me too harshly. I don't know about you, but I, I love looking at different items on Amazon. In fact, half of my Amazon account, I think, is filled with different books that I intend to buy. Uh, you might be the same. You might look and think, hey, this is an item at one time, maybe down the future, I want to purchase. And so instead of buying it at that particular moment, you save it for later. And I, out of curiosity, thought, well, I wonder how many items in my cart have I saved for later? And to my maybe chagrin, I had 155 items in my cart. I was a little taken back by that. Again, don't be too judgmental. A lot of them were books. And I thought, well, maybe this is I have a serious problem or I have incredible self-restraint that I didn't buy all of these items. But you have probably maybe ordered something online and you saw that particular item and maybe you saw it different pictures of it and different angles of it and you thought this is going to be the solution to whatever need that you maybe had at that particular time but that's just an it's an image it's a picture it's a representation of a particular substance and don't miss this when you're reading the old testament so much of what is conveyed in the old testament is a shadow leading to a greater substance there is the tabernacle and the temple of the old testament that was a significant place of worship for the nation of Israel, but it points to a greater, if you will, presence that will be embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. The shadow pointing to the substance. We get kind of enamored with Old Testament figures such as David. But let me say this. King David was a man after God's own heart, but he had some incredible failures. What should it make us do when we read David? We should see him, if you will, as a shadow 
pointing to a greater David that will one day, praise God, rule and reign for a thousand years. When we think about Moses, he was a wonderful prophet, greatly used of God and the meekest man that ever lived. But he even prophesied in Deuteronomy 18 that there is going to come a prophet like as unto him. Could I say that prophet has come? It is found in the person, in the substance of Jesus Christ. Christ, and it allows us a lens to view and to see the Old Testament so we understand these shadows are pointing to a greater reality. Why is he telling them this particular truth? They were, if you will, tempted to think, let's go back to the rituals of sacrifice. Let's go back to the adherence to the feast. Understand this. This was more than likely pinned between 64 and 67 A.D., the temple was not destroyed until 70 AD. This is not a past reality. This is a present reality. Sacrifices were still taking place. Feasts and those celebrations were still taking place. Now they're thinking, should we go back? Should we go back to the shadows? And the author says, no, those were mere shadows. You have the substance. Who is the substance? Verses 5 through uh, 13 talk about the incarnation, the person of Jesus Christ. Quickly, I want you to notice what it says in verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices. But notice this, again, this is in reference to the Old Testament, which can never take away sins. But notice verse 12, but this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice, which would be himself, notice this, for sins forever, I would encourage you, if you underline in your Bible, to underline these two words, sat down on the right hand of God. Contrast verse 11 with verse 12. The priest continually stood and offered sacrifices. What does that imply? It was continuous. It was not to be one time and finished. Why did they continually stand? Why did they continually offer? Because it did not have the power to remove sin. So they stood and continued to offer. When Jesus Christ offered himself, he sat down. What does that imply? It is finished. There is no longer any sacrifices. There is no longer any lambs because the lamb has come, Jesus Christ. What does this do for us? You're thinking, how come all of this doctrine Notice what happens. We again, just for time's sake, we won't go through all of this, but notice verse number uh, 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. This is a reference back to Jeremiah 31 about the new covenant, which again was instituted with Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Now where remission or forgiveness of, uh, of there is, now where remission of these is, sorry, there is no more offering for sin. We as believers are forgiven. We had sinned against the holy God, but now we stand sanctified, holy, with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. We stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We stand forgiven. There is no charge held against us, not because of our own goodness, not because of our own works, and certainly not because of our own merit, but because of Jesus Christ. You see, it wasn't through baptism. It wasn't through church membership. For these Jews that were living back in the first century, it wasn't through the actual physical sacrifice. It was faith in the substance, Jesus Christ. And when they place their faith in Jesus Christ, they stand forgiven, no longer held to their account. But I want you to notice the transition that we see in verse 19. Look at it with me, if you will. I'll actually ask you to say these two words out loud if you don't mind. Could you say the first two words in verse 19 for me? Having therefore. Now look at verse number 21. Could you say the first two words there? All right, doing good. Uh, this looks like, feels like I'm in college again. Verse 22. First two words there in verse 22. Okay, so notice what's taking place here. This is your reality this is what christ accomplished and because of this let us so notice what he does here he shows any details this is what christ accomplished and because of what 
Christ accomplished, this is the action that should follow. It leads us or points us to the indicative. This is the fact which then pushes us toward the imperative because and based on this fact, this is what it should push us to do. So having this forgiveness, we are sanctified, we are adopted and we are accepted, we are forgiven and we are redeemed. And this had only come through the person of Jesus Christ. Having therefore, let us. What we see here is that the actions or the, rather the accomplishments of Jesus Christ lead us to action. Real quickly, for time's sake, I'm going to go through this very quickly. But I want you to notice three actions a believer should take because of the accomplishment of Christ. Number one, because of what Christ accomplished for us, our actions should be one of communion. We see the first let us in verse 22. Let us draw near. Notice this word draw near means to approach or to come near. It carries the idea of being in communion, in fellowship, in conversation, to speak with, to relate to, to have a communion, if you will, in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice how we're supposed to approach him, the authenticity of how we're supposed to approach him. Or notice verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. That word true means sincere. Unfortunately, we can be professional Christians in the most negative sense. I heard a quote, and I've shared this often, from A.W. Tozer, but he says that Christians do not tell lies, they just sing them. When I read that, I thought, wow, that feels like a dagger to the heart. What did he mean by that? He means that oftentimes when we come to worship, we are so maybe ritualistic, we are so perfunctory, and it can't can become so habitual that it just is meaningless words that we're reciting. And there's many a times in a worship service when I'm praising and singing unto God that I have to stop, look at the words and say, do I really mean this? The truth is, not only does that happen in our worship and in our praise, it also happens in our prayer life. There are times that we approach the throne of grace, yes, but it is so monotonous, it is so, this is routine, and to some degree it is so empty that we don't really stop and think, God, I am coming to you, not out of pretense, not because a particular person in my family expects me to, but I am coming unto your throne of grace, humbly, but sincerely, to commune, to converse, to relate to my God. Why? Because this is what you've accomplished. This is what you've done. And I just want to sincerely praise you for that. I want to thank you for that. I want to express my gratitude. God, there's been some difficulty in this week. There's been some struggles. There's been some hardship. And I'm not coming to you out of show. I'm not coming to you out of obligation I'm not coming to you out of guilt. I'm not coming to you because it's expected of me, but I'm coming to you in truth, in sincerity, in authenticity. Notice as well, not just with authenticity, but with assurance. Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. That word full assurance, those words mean to be free in our speaking, to speak openly with complete Certainty. It implies confidence and boldness. Notice verse 19. I love this. In verse 19, he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Notice how we enter into the holiest. Now, again, there's an Old Testament, I think, implication here that you remember the tabernacle had the outer court, then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. There was only one individual that was ordained or appointed or allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. But he was only permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies, which again was where the presence of God resided. He could only enter into the Holy of Holies once a year. And if anyone thought they could enter in 
uninvited or they did not have that particular office of the high priest, God says, you will die. Now he's saying you can enter into, because the veil has been rent by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, and we can enter in not ashamedly, not timidly, not, if you will, as someone that is uh, uh, afraid or fearful, certainly not arrogantly, but we can come in with boldness, with confidence. What is this based on? Verse 19 says, by the blood of Jesus. Now, don't miss this. There has been times in my Christian journey that I thought because I did pretty well that week as a Christian, I could come boldly. There's been times when I would look at my Christian walk and I would think, you know, I, I've, I've treated my wife pretty well. I, I've even handed out a few tracts this week. I've, I've done pretty good as a Christian. So now I think I've earned the right to come boldly into the throne of grace. Now, there is an element of truth to the fact that we ought to know that we cannot hold on to sin and come boldly into the throne of grace. However, don't miss this. The only reason that we can come into the throne room of God, the holiest of holies, is because of the merit of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. We do not come into his throne room thinking, I've earned my right. I've earned a hearing with the God of creation. I've earned a right for the I am to hear my voice. Never have we earned that right we only have that right because we are a child of God. And when we come to the throne of grace, may we not come just, well, here's my prayer, but may we come with full assurance of faith. Could I ask you this? When you come to God, are you coming in faith? Because of what Christ accomplished, I'll hasten our action should be one of communion. Secondly, our action should be one of commitment. Verse 23, notice the second, let us. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith or the confession of our faith. That word hold fast means to hold on. The confession or the profession refers to the faith or the doctrine the believers have acknowledged as truth. My wife and I enjoy going down to Toronto I have a lot of people find that hard to believe. Uh, in our church, at least, I think, why do you do that? But we actually do enjoy it. Uh, just the other day, yesterday, we went down and we saw these sailboats. It was a beautiful day, of course. And there was, I don't know, 40 to 50 out there, maybe 300, 500 meters off the shore. I don't know. And they weren't necessarily headed in any direction, but they were just kind of floating, drifting, just out there enjoying the day. Well, occasionally we would talk and then we'd look back up and we would see that it had drifted a little off. And then we talk a little bit more and we see that it continued to drift a little bit off. I don't think there was an intention to drift in any particular direction. I don't think they thought we're going to head this particular way. But because of the fact that they were not, if you will, anchored, because they were not, if you will, moored to the harbor, they were going to have a tendency just naturally to drift in their spiritual life and we as christians if we're not careful if we do not hold fast to the doctrine and can i say this not preference not things that are maybe more methodology preference or personality issues but true doctrinal truth we as believers need to hold fast to the truth that has been handed down to us. Why? Because Christ has accomplished much for us. And could I encourage you as you have been and as you continue, for Kitchener Baptist Church, could I encourage you, continue to hold fast, continue to stick to the truth, continue to stick through the gospel, to stick to the, the deity of Jesus Christ. He encourages them because of what Christ accomplished that should lead us to an action of communion, but also an action of commitment. Lastly, and I'm done. Because of what Christ accomplished for us, our action should be one of consideration. Notice the last let us in verse 24, and let us consider one another. That word consider means to observe, to fix one's eyes or mind upon. In fact, it's the same uh, word that's used in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 when it says, consider 
Christ. It's not a casual glance. It's meditating on, fixating on. But what are we to consider? Notice this, and let us consider one another. So we are, according to this particular verse, that we are to consider each other. Well, what are we to consider? What are we to think on? When someone comes to your mind and you're thinking, I know this person's usually here on Sunday night. I know this person's usually here on Sunday morning. What should I think about that particular person? Certainly it should not be just, well, I get along with them. We have some pretty good conversations at church. Certainly there's nothing wrong with that. Hopefully, though there can be a tendency in all of us, that we don't think of other believers and just think of their faults and their failures, their shortcomings, the things that we wish were different. No, what we see here is that we are to consider one another. Notice this next word, to provoke. That word provoke means to stir up. Now, usually the word provoke has a very negative connotation to it. I was the youngest of three. I have an older brother and an older sister. When I was younger, much, much, much younger, I could say that I had, if you will, a PhD in provocation. I had the spiritual gift. I knew exactly what to do to stir up my brother. I knew where to poke him. I knew what to take from his bedroom. I knew exactly how to push his buttons. Now, praise God, I've grown in grace and gotten far beyond that, maybe. And I knew exactly what to do to provoke my sister, what to do to rile her up, to get some form of a reaction out of her. But obviously, that's not the type of provocation. What we see here is that we're to consider, to provoke unto love and to good works. Notice verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. In closing, I'd like to have you consider this. I think there can be a misconception that church can become nothing more than being present. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. Has there been times that maybe in your life, in your Christian walk, that you would look at your Christian walk and say, well, I'm, I'm present in church, therefore I'm doing what is expected of me as a Christian, check. We should be present. We are expected and exhorted to not forsake the assembly, that we would come together to exhort one another, to love one another, to hear the word preached, to worship together. But yet, I think there are some that would say, well, I want to go beyond just being present in church, and I want to move to this next step that I want to participate. Maybe there's a particular ministry that I can be involved in. Maybe there's uh, an area that I can, I can help in. I want to participate in church. But notice, according to this particular verse, yes, we are to be present in church. Yes, we should have some form of participation. We sing, we, we maybe teach. But in this particular verse, the exhortation goes to provocation. And could I ask you this? If you were to categorize yourself, would you say, I'm the present type of church member. I come, and I'm very, very faithful. Could I encourage you that through the work of the Holy Spirit, that maybe you would say, help me, God, to move from just being present to participating? How could I be involved? How, what ministry could I maybe help in? But going beyond that, that every single individual in the body of Christ would come to every single church service whenever the assembly comes together and that we have this mindset to think, I wonder who I can provoke. It's not, if you will, extemporaneous. It's not spontaneous. It's not, well, that person's over there. There's no one else that's really sitting them with them. I'm going to go and try to provoke. No, no, no. This exhortation is to meditate, to fix our eyes on. And I wonder in our lives if God would allow us to say, God, when I come to the assembly, when I come to church, help me not just to be present. Help me not just to participate but help my mindset and my heart to be one of provocation. Could I say this? One of the biggest temptations, I think, throughout these last two years, and I'll be absolutely honest, we had to, at times, go to, to online services at Faithway. 
usually pastoral staff had to attend and we were there just to support and, and to help and different things such as that. But there was rare occasions that we would be able to watch from home. Now, if I'm going to be completely transparent, um, no suit and tie, sitting on your couch with your favorite cup of coffee, watching a service and praising God. I kind of liked it a little bit. I could actually be present and kind of participate remotely. But you know one thing I couldn't do? There wasn't much provocation. You see, forsaking and not forsaking the assembly goes far beyond just being present. Not forsaking the assembly is because we cannot provoke one another to love and to good work. Could I say this? I need provocation. You ever gotten stagnant in your Christian walk? Indifferent to every message, indifferent to every devotional, indifferent to every song. It's just, I'm here, but I'm not here. You know what I needed? I needed another brother or sister in Christ to say, God's put you on my heart, and I've been considering you, and I want to help, and I want to encourage, and I want to pray, and I want to provoke to love and to good works. May we as believers do this, not out of, okay, now something else to do. No. Christ, this is what you accomplished. How could this not lead me to some form of action? The Christian life was not meant to be led based upon guilt. Think about Romans 12. Many of you could quote it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. What does it beseech us to do? Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Why in the world would we do that? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies. What mercies? Chapters 1 through chapter 11. He's referencing back. He laid the groundwork of what Christ did on our behalf. And then he finally gets to, this should lead you. This should lead us to action. Could I encourage you this week? Think about what Christ accomplished for you. Think about uh, what Christ did and what that did for us. Forgiveness, acceptance, love. A place with Jesus Christ in heaven. And may that accomplishment lead us to action. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to pray and then I'll turn the service over to Pastor Burns.